Oh, it's great to be back. It was nice to spend the weekend up north and uh, just worship in a different setting. It's always neat to just, you know, check out another church and just see how other Jesus followers uh, do this. And so that was a lot of fun connecting with friends. Um, the other thing was I had a blueberry sour cream donut. And it's my goal this summer to make sure that stays permanently on the Tim Hortons menu. So that made the weekend great. Uh, one lake cider took me up on the recommendation a couple weeks ago and circled back and said, you know, I've always wondered what soggy drywall tasted like, and now I know. It's like, oh, it's okay. We can still be friends. This is wide embrace, wide embrace here. So I'm sorry if that was your experience, but, you know, for the sour cream donut lovers, we got it. We have also been treated to three rich and deep and inspiring messages over the last three weeks. And I hope you felt challenged, and I actually hope that we felt a wee bit uncomfortable as we've been pushed out of our comfort zones and reminded, sorry, I was reminded this week, uh, Brene Brown, any Brene Brown fans here? Yes. Well, when she used to be a professor, at least she probably still is, but she had this mantra on her door. And she said, if you, being her students, don't feel uncomfortable, then I'm not teaching. And if I'm not feeling uncomfortable, you're not learning. If you don't feel uncomfortable, I'm not teaching. And really, that's how it is with the gospel. The gospel, Jesus, disrupts our comfort. And all the swag-wearing chosen followers in the room, you know this from watching The Chosen. Jesus is always pushing us out of our comfort zone, expanding our view and our embrace. Jesus disrupts our certainty. Jesus exposes our blind spots. Jesus, understood rightly, challenges our prejudices, our values, our budgets, and makes us feel uncomfortable. And God is always up to something new and making new things. And I believe that. Do you? Some, maybe? Yes! God is always up to something new and making new things. And I'm just so thankful for that. And I really believe that God is making something new of us here at Lakeside. In us, individually, but also in us, collectively. And maybe today is your first day in church. Maybe you've decided it's your last day in church. Maybe you've decided it's your first and last day in church. But could you just take this with you? God is always making new things, and making things new. And if you could just take that with you, that is a truth that is life-changing if we're open to it. And speaking of new, Rachel already mentioned that we're starting a new series, Experiencing Jesus, and I'm so excited about it. We've been through kind of a heady season since February, right? Going through the old story, well, yeah, the old stories, Sunday school stories, some of us grew up with those stories, unpacking and peeling back the cultural layers, the historical layers, the linguistic layers, and discovering or rediscovering the messages that have been maybe hiding underneath some of those rather difficult stories. And we've been doing that since February, and so someone said to me, um, do you think we could do something lighter? <laughs> so I'm not sure if this series is lighter or not, but maybe what, we, what this series will do is grab at our hearts over our heads. Obviously, we want to grab at our hearts all the time, but this one, I think, is geared more to the heart. And I got to confess, I live in my head. So information is mind candy for me. And peeling back the layers of scripture and discovering God there, discovering Jesus is just like, I can't get enough of it. And so this series is going to drive me into my heart. And so I'm looking forward to that. And I hope you will be too. Over the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at different versions or facets or faces of Jesus. As we sort of turn that gem of scripture, we're going to see Jesus from different angles. Some might be familiar and some not and my hope is that in experiencing Jesus in new ways, it'll be less about knowing about Jesus, facts about Jesus in our heads, and more about experiencing Jesus in our hearts. And this is so critical. This is so critical, friends, because when we come to know Jesus, we come to know God, because Jesus is the face of God, and God has always been like Jesus. 
I love this quote by Adolf Hall. He says, Whatever, whoever feels attracted to Jesus cannot adequately explain why. We must be prepared to be always correcting our image of Jesus, for we will never exhaust what there is to know. We'll never exhaust what there is to know. Jesus is full of surprises. And that's it. That's it. We're always correcting our image of Jesus. And as the exact representation of God, as God in human flesh, that means we are always correcting our image of God. And this isn't new. Even in Jesus' lifetime, he was constantly, constantly correcting people's image of God. They were sure they knew what God was like. They didn't like it when he did that. People were sure they knew who God was, what God expected, who God liked, how God worked. And they crucified him for challenging their certainty. At Jesus' grave, Only hours after his death, Mary Magdalene arrives to grieve and to weep, and instead she's met by two angels. And have a look at what they said. This is found in John 20, if you're following along in your Bibles. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Mary, who'd spent three years following Jesus, listening to his teaching, eating with Jesus, and she didn't recognize him. You see, the Jesus she met in the garden was not the Jesus she expected. She had to learn to see Jesus in a new way, a different way. The disciples, the people, and the people who followed Jesus saw him as a great teacher, a prophet, maybe, maybe even the Messiah, someone who was going to overthrow the Romans and, you know, reinstate the throne and install a king and make Israel great again. They were going to rule the world. In fact, two of Jesus' closest disciples, James and John, they wanted to be at his right and left in this new, this new hierarchy, this new monarchy, this new rule. One wanted to be VP, the other secretary of state. But here's what Jesus said. Whoever is the least among you is the greatest. And they're like, whoa, who is this? This is a different God than we expected, a different Messiah, a different, a, a different representation of God than we expected. If, he, if he's not a conquering king, then who is he? What do we do with him? Do you remember Saul? Saul who became Paul and wrote pr- pr- pretty much half the New Testament. He was a devout Jew. He followed all 613 laws. He could recite the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, by heart, all the genealogies, all the laws. He probably knew more than that, but he knew at least that. Can you imagine the perseverance that would take? The effort, the zeal? I mean, you can go ahead and try it. Let me know how that goes. But, but that was a long haul, memorizing those five books. He was of the class of the Pharisees, sort of the keepers of the law, the police, He was convinced he knew God. He was certain of who God was. He was zealous for God. But when God showed up as Jesus and put relationship over regulations, Saul didn't know what to do. Saul didn't recognize God in his midst. And look at this. Right after Jesus' crucifixion, This is what it says in Acts 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, which is the way of Jesus, Jesus' followers, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. What an aha moment for Saul. What an awful aha moment. 
This crucified Galilean peasant whose followers Saul was bent on destroying was in fact God. This earthy, poor, homeless rabbi teacher with this ragtag bunch of followers was in fact God, the God he'd been pursuing his whole life. He'd committed his entire life to this. Imagine how his head was reeling, how his heart must have been aching and breaking. All of that zeal for God. And yet, Saul missed God when God was right there in his midst. Can you imagine the emotional pain and turmoil the heavy weight of regret. Maybe you know it firsthand. Maybe you've thrown yourself into something you were sure God was leading you into, only for it to come crashing down. Saul had committed his entire life to certainty about God. One version of God that was so influenced by the culture, so he couldn't accept God when God would present himself like Jesus. That that God would prefer to hang out with quote-unquote sinners, those who didn't follow the 613 rules, than he would with the religious elites. We could say Paul, sorry, Saul was offended by God. Saul had one view of God, transcendent and with high expectations and lofty, who needed to be appeased, much like the gods of the other cultures. And Saul didn't recognize God. Somehow he knew it was God speaking, but this God didn't fit his expectations. Saul saw God, saw Jesus in a new way, in a different way, and he was blown away. You see, often when Jesus shows up, he messes everything up, doesn't he? He messes with our values and our priorities and our expectations and our blind spots and our prejudices. And we could spend all day going through scripture. There's so many more who had to unlearn and relearn who God is, whose image of God had to be dismantled so that they could see God more clearly. In a moment, Saul became a follower of Jesus, not because of any teaching or creeds or anything of the sort, but because he met him. He experienced Jesus. He would have failed any Jesus quiz, but he knew Jesus. That's how I want to know Jesus. That's how I want you to know Jesus. You know, at a critical point in Jesus' ministry, he asked his disciples the most important question. Do you know what it is? Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And Saul asked Jesus the same sort of critical question. Who are you, Lord? Who are you? And I want to ask us the same question. Who do we say Jesus is? Who are you? Lord. A.W. Tozer was a a great author and theologian and pastor of the 20th century. And he said, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Hopefully, when we think about God, when we think of God, we think of Jesus. When we hear the word God, we think of Jesus. And for many of us who have grown up in church, we have this view of God, and then we have this view of Jesus. And they're not always the same. Let me ask you, when you think of God, do you immediately think of Jesus? When you hear the word God, do you think of Jesus? Do you imagine Jesus? Because that was God's intention. Finally, God came and revealed God's full self in the person of Jesus. He wanted to correct all of our false images that we had of God. A God who loves the world. A God who befriends those that the world discards and finds disposable. A God who embraces the homeless and the hungry, the wandering and the wounded, the outcast and the overlooked. A God who would die to reveal God's love for us. A God who will make all things new. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. And we crucified that God. The early followers of Jesus recognized Jesus as God. The early church embraced Jesus as God. And somewhere along the way, Jesus and God got a bit separated again in our minds. And Jesus became the one who rescued us from God. 
He became sort of this iron gate to God. Jesus has become an exam. He had to have the right answers, abide by the right code, dress the right way, rather than someone to be encountered and experienced. That's my longing, friends, that we would experience Jesus. There's so many faces of Jesus to be discovered. Some we may welcome, some we may not. Some of you know Jesus as Savior, the one who died because of our sin. Some of you know Jesus as friend, the confidant that we turn to, while others know him as Lord, the one we bow to and, and surrender to. And all of these are, are true in some form, but they are on their own, they're incomplete. And so often the church has preferred one version of Jesus over the others, which is often different again than the version of God we have. Somehow God and Jesus don't share the same image. It's something we tried to undo in our last series, the heady series, the stuff you didn't hear in Sunday school series. Trying to show that behind all of this cultural baggage, there is the heart of God and the heart of God is Jesus. But undoing and unlearning is hard. It's harder than learning. But if we don't think of Jesus when we think of God, our image of God is incomplete. And the phrase we repeat often here in relation to the Bible is if it doesn't look like Jesus, something else is going on. Because God has always looked like Jesus. And as we look at the different facets of Jesus, I hope that we're going to experience him in a new way. I hope that we're going to be surprised, that we're going to be uncomfortable, that we're going to be blown away at the Jesus we discover and experience. And so today we're looking at Jesus as friend. And we have a general concept of friendship here in the West, don't we? Friends are loyal until they're not. Uh, friends are the ones we turn to in times of joy and celebration and grief and, and heartache. Friends bear us up. We have friends and then we have friends. We have different levels of friendship. We have social media friends and then we have friend friends. And sometimes they overlap. The world of Jesus was the world of the Romans but they were heavily influenced by the Greeks who had occupied that land for centuries. Greek thought, Greek philosophy, Greek values were baked into the soil. Aristotle, who was ment mentored by Plato, who was mentored by Socrates, was a big deal. Their culture was such saturated with it. It was well respected. And Aristotle said that friendship is equality. That was his definition of friendship. The Greek thought was, a friend is like a second self. Jewish writers said, a friend is the equal of one's, of one's own soul. True friends came through in times of trouble. Even if you're exiled, friends will be there for you. They were your confidants. They share all things in common. They had a very, very high view of friendship. So Jesus chooses that word in his final moments with his disciples. In John chapter 15, before he leaves, and this is what he says to them. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I don't call you servants any longer because the servant doesn't know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from the Father. This would have blown the disciples' minds. They had no concept of this in their relationship with Jesus. They considered themselves disciples of a great rabbi, a great teacher. And they knew and they understood this hierarchy. You see, the difference between a servant-master relationship is that servants don't know what the master's thinking, and servants kind of withhold secrets from their masters. We see this even in the pages of the Gospels when the disciples are kind of whispering among themselves, wondering this and wondering that, rather than going to the master, Jesus, for the answer. You see, the rabbi-disciple model reflected the master-servant relationship. Rabbis were revered teachers. They were highly respected. People begged to be a follower of a great rabbi, or they paid to be a follower. And there was this understanding of a power differential. They were at the rabbi's beck and call as a servant is to the master. And they were, they were okay with that. That's what they'd signed on for. So imagine their stunned silence when Jesus calls them friends, equals, confidants, soulmates 
second self. Jesus was binding himself to them in loyalty. This would have been enormous for them. It is for us if we stop to consider it. Jesus wasn't flippant with the language. He knew exactly what he was doing when he reached for that word friend. He knew how loaded that word was, that what they understood by that word. And I don't know about you, but, but as I sit with that, I'm struggling to fathom it. Jesus saying to us, you're like my second self. You're my soulmate. We're kindred spirits. Jesus is going to be loyal to me regardless of my choices and decisions and mistakes. I'm in the second self. It's just mind-blowing when we sit with that. The ancient Greek philosopher Plutarch lived at the time of Jesus, and he was highly influential in the culture, and he noted that children had the ability to form, forge true relationships, true, friend, true friendships, void of politics or obligation or any of that something gifted to them by nature that's lost to us as adults. And maybe this is why Jesus said, unless you become like little children, you can't enter the kingdom of God. You can't taste life as God intends it. Maybe Jesus is saying, if you can't reclaim the way of trust and innocent friendship and playfulness, you'll never taste the kingdom of God the way God intends life to be. Trust and playfulness. I love that. Is that what we think of, though, when we think of God, trust, kindred spirit, second self, playfulness? Is that what you think about when you think about the Christian life or following Jesus? Have a look at this slide. It's a, a picture that went viral in 2019. It's two little boys the little white boy's named Connor, and he's autistic, and it was his first day in second grade, first day of school, first day in second grade, first day going to school by himself. And the bus ride went fine, but the minute he stepped off the bus, he just froze in fear, and he started to cry. Another boy, coincidentally named Christian, <laughs> came over to comfort him, and he took Connor's hand, and he led him into school, Someone took a picture of it, and it went viral. There were reporters. Connor told them that he found me. Christian found me, and he held my hand, and I got happy tears. Connor's mom says Christian is Connor's first real friend. A little black boy named Con Christian reaches out his hand to a little white boy named Connor, cowering in fear. You can't make this up. Now, the astute reader of that passage would say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this kind of sounds conditional to me. If you do what I command you, then you can be my friend. But it's not conditional on Jesus' part. It's the freedom to choose. The Jesus way or our own way. You see, Christian reached out in compassion. Connor didn't have to take his hand. Christian would have felt the same way about Connor, but Connor wouldn't have been able to enter into the joy of that friendship. It's conditional on our part. Jesus doesn't force us. Jesus never forces us. Instead, he reaches out in love and invites us to accept his invitation. Would you be my friend? Jesus' command is love and all that comes from love. And love is never coercive. And here's the thing. Often the hand of Jesus, the invitation to love and friendship is the hand of someone else. Someone else reaching out. Sometimes ours is the hand that reaches out and sometimes we're the ones cowering in fear. As we come into this building on a Sunday morning or we watch online, sometimes we're the one who's reaching out the hand and other times we just need that hand, don't we? St. Teresa of Avila, you, we might remember Joash quoted her a couple of weeks ago. She said this, Christ has no body but ours, no hands, no feet on earth but ours. Ours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on the world. Ours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Ours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. We are Jesus' second self. Entrusted. We've been entrusted with that. Kindred spirits, if you will. Scholar Craig Keener says, Jesus brought his followers to the very heart of God and revealed that God's heart longs for friendship. 
Is that the image of God you have? A God that longs for friendship with you? Maybe you've never had that image of God, the God who longs to befriend us, to walk among us, to dig in the dirt of our messes and to be there with us in the midst of our failures and to make something new. But that's the image of God we see in Jesus. And God has always been like Jesus. You know, friendship with God wasn't totally foreign to the disciples. After all, they'd grown up with the biblical stories. They knew Abraham and Moses were called friends of God. But Abraham and Moses, they were super saints. They were celebrities in the faith world. And they're this ragtag bunch of fishermen and tax collectors and guerrilla warriors. So again, imagine their shock and disbelief, even discomfort with this. Jesus has collapsed the distance between God and us. There's no distance. And it was so revolutionary to them in a world where Caesar was God and he was feared and he had no friends and the Egyptians and the Persians, they all had their pantheon of gods and not, none of them were considered to be friends with the people. They used people in their imagination. They were to be satisfied. Their wrath was to be appeased. And Jesus said, I have called you friends. He's showing them a God who reaches towards us in love and in compassion. Not a terrifying judge that you always have to look over your shoulder, that we have to please, but a loyal friend. And if you've grown up with a fearful image of God, Jesus is saying, no, no, <laughs> that's not God. If you've seen me, you've seen God. Inviting us into friendship. We can take it or we can leave it. It won't change God's heart towards us. God will always be extending out that hand, inviting us into friendship. We'll just miss out on the friendship. For Jesus to call them friends, he was stooping to their level. He was leveling the ground beneath them and his friendship was unconditional. And this was risky, right? You know, we know friendship is risky. Some of you have small scars, large scars, open wounds from friends so-called who have betrayed you, abandoned you, stabbed you in the back. Friendship is risky. And it was for Jesus. Remember Judas <laughs> who betrayed Jesus? Jesus shared his last meal with Judas. Jesus, Jesus invited Judas into his inner circle. He washed his feet. He was among those whom Jesus called friend. And even after his dastardly act of betraying Jesus, look at what Jesus says. Matthew 26, starting at 49. At once he, that's Judas, came up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. Now that was the agreed upon sign to identify the person the guards were to arrest. Jesus said to him, Friend, friend, do what you're here to do. Friend, unconditional love. Unconditional love and loyalty. The author Paul Waddell wrote, true friendships are not relationships we control, but adventures we enter into, and I would add risks we take. But there's another surprise, if that wasn't enough. In verse 17 of John 15, Jesus says, I'm giving you these commands so that you will love one another. So you mean my friendship with God means I have to love others? <laughs> this isn't just a me and Jesus thing, a me and God thing? No. Friendship with God means friendship with those God loves. Friendship with those God has befriended. There's no way out of it. And as Rachel comes to just create some space for us this morning, I want to I think about that. I want us to really pause and think about that. And I love thought experiments, <laughs> so humor me here for a minute. Are you ready for the thought experiment? Imagine everyone in the world are friends. I know it's impossible. I'm just asking us to engage our imaginations for a minute. Now, I'm a foodie. So when I imagine that, I imagine a table that's so big. And the whole world is there. All the cultures are there and they're bringing their foods and their spices and their dishes. 
And they're sharing stories with each other. They're sharing their hurts. They're making up. Or maybe you imagine a dance floor and everyone's dancing together, twirling together. What if, what if friendship with Jesus opened us up to seeing everyone as a friend? Think of the impact on the world. On our responses, in emails. There's this exercise that I do when I get a not so nice email. You know, you furiously write your answer. Of course, you don't send it for 24 hours. We all know that, right? I imagine I'm writing this to a friend, giving this person the benefit of the doubt. How does that change the language and how does that change the tone? When we think of another person as a friend, it just changes the lens with which we see them. But if we opened ourselves up to seeing everyone as a friend, would we ever hold a friend in slavery? Would we see them as less than ourselves or below us? Would we demean them or mock them or mock their culture, their accent, their language? Would we leave them on the street? Would we invade them and steal their resources? Would we bond them or slaughter them if everyone were friends? Do you see the world impact here? Do you see why Jesus said it's so important that we know that we are friends with Jesus, that Jesus is friends with all of us, whether we accept that friendship or not? And it sounds too simple, doesn't it? Except I think it's really hard, especially if we bring in the world to our own families, <laughs> to our office, to our school, to our neighborhood, to our street. It sounds too simple. But for God, friendship is for the sake of the world. And in friendship with the world, we find Jesus. I'm going to say that again. For God, friendship with Jesus is for the sake of the world. And in friendship with the world, we find Jesus. And I love that idea. Is it naive? Maybe. Is it the Jesus way? Definitely. So I just wonder if we could pause as we close and just consider one of these, maybe not all of them. Can you try to imagine the world connected by friendship? Or your neighborhood, or your school, your condo building, connected by friendship, all eating at the same table, all sharing life. Change starts in our imagination. Or who do you struggle to include in your friendship circle? Can you imagine them there at your table? And as friends of Jesus, how would our days or interactions unfold? Just pause for a moment. I wonder if we can carry that thought experiment into the week. <laughs> when someone cuts you off, I'm speaking to myself here. <laughs> Friend, bless you, right? Can we continue to play with that in our imagination? Wonder what it could look like. And if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus. This, you're new to faith. Wow, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to introduce you to Jesus. Our prayer team will be up at the front. <clears throat> They'd love to do... <clears throat> share that with you. And if you would like prayer, that's what they love to do. And so our prayer teams are there. The book sales down the hall. The youth room's open. If there's young people here and you just want to play pool or foosball, that's available there while your parents visit. Can I just close us with a benediction? Bless us as we go. 
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the friendship of the Holy Spirit go with you. Bless you, friends. Have a great week.